Information, is it an asset or a liability? Well, that depends on who you're speaking to in an organization. With today's trends in big data, most organizations are looking at big data as an opportunity. Uh, at the same time, many IT organizations are struggling with data growth and flat budgets. So how do you reconcile the opportunity of big data with the challenges of data growth and the implications to the organization in terms of risk management? Well, we're here today with Randolph Kahn, who is the principal of Kahn Consulting. Uh, Randy is an expert on legal and compliance and policy issues related to business information, electronic records, and information technology. Randy, welcome to theCUBE. Hey, thanks so much, Dave. So we're here uh, to talk about a new book uh, that Randy has, uh, in the process of, of writing, should be out in a couple of months. It's called Chucking Daisies, How Companies Deal with Big Data. So, uh, well, first of all, congratulations on almost <laughs> having the book done. And uh, this is, uh, I think you said your sixth book, uh, which is fantastic. So tell us about the book. What's the premise behind it? So, you know, just the way you started the conversation, this idea that information is an asset, well, that's true, but if organizations can actually find this stuff, uh, it's no longer an asset, it's a liability, it's a cost, it's a, a pile of risk, it's a pile of inconvenience, it's a pile of inefficiency, right? So Chuck and Daisies is a Bible for IT professionals with simple rules that say, you know, thou shalt, you IT professional, do the following things to manage information, um, right size your information footprint, keep the stuff that you need to keep, get rid of the crud, and it's really a book to help the IT professionals sort of walk through that problem. When you got this big pile of data, what do I keep, what do I get rid of, how do I do it in a legally defensible uh, kind of way, and that's really what Chuck and Davies is about. So wh where'd you get the name? Well, it's, uh, if you think about a flower, right, you know, we're going into fall, and it's sort of the end of the, the growing life cycle, right? You go outside, there's these beautiful leaves. Uh, you know, that's just a couple weeks away from looking like death. Well, if you take a look at the life cycle of information, right, that daisy in spring looks beautiful, and it's, it's, it's grabbing sun from the sky, and it's, it's crisp, and the colors of the leaves are, are brilliant. And then over the course of its short little life, right, the value of that thing declines. I don't think that most IT professionals think about information as having a life cycle. I mean, in fact, if you look at most organizations today, most folks are keeping everything without regard to what the heck it is, costing them huge amounts of dough, right? So this idea of the daisy, the idea of chucking the daisy at the end of its useful life, when its value has declined, when it's no longer attractive, and that's the same with information. At the end of the information's life cycle, the idea of parking it somewhere in a, a, a repository, uh, a shared drive, it's an expense. It's a liability. And I think IT professionals need to understand the importance of that life cycle. You also use big data in the title. And as I was saying up front, a lot of people are looking at, at data as an opportunity. And, Many organizations don't want to throw away that, that data because there might be some diamond in the rough that they can find years down the road. Uh, are you suggesting that that's uh, the wrong strategy? And, and can you give us some uh, insight in that regard? Absolutely. So you know, the idea of big data is that you have this uh, pool of information that you're able to harness and extract to see trends, to understand your business in a, in, a, in a deeper, more significant kind of way so that you can be a more efficient business and you can also plan the future. But the problem is, for most organizations, you think about it this way, for the last two or three decades, organizations have been applying uh, information technology and systems to all kinds of business processes. Today, everything is electronic, and for every system, there's electronic information. Right? The pool grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. And at some point, big companies have hundreds of terabytes of extraneous stuff or even petabytes of extraneous stuff. What the heck is it? So big data is this idea that I can take tools and I can understand my business and be a better, more efficient business if I can harness that stuff. Well, actually, for most businesses today, they have so much stuff and they don't have the tools that they need, that that pile of data 
uh, is wholly underutilized. They can't find the records they need to find. Organizations now regularly have to recreate information because they can't find the stuff that they have. Litigation of response tells us over and over and over again companies don't have their act together. So, you know, I would tell you that, that, that harnessing information in big data context uh, is aspirational for most organizations. I would say ubiquitous mismanagement is much more the theme of the day. So, Randy, with the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure in the mid-2000s, I think 2006 came to four, the general counsel in various organizations had a lot of power to essentially dictate the policies of organizations in terms of records retention and, and, and data, deleting data and the like. Have they not been successful in your regard? Uh, and is the, is the pendulum swinging back the marketing pendulum, if you will, toward you know, big data becoming this opportunity? And what risks does that pose to organizations? So you asked a whole bunch of stuff. Let me start with the general counsel. Let me also address records management. So for the records managers, they're not going to want to hear this. And if you heard me speak before, you've heard me say it before. But this is the reality. Records management for most organizations is a total, utter failure. I mean, think about it this way. The, 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 the belief about records management is I will create rules. That rule will tell me how long I need to keep stuff. And then at the end of its useful life, that stuff will go away. Well, I've got to tell you something. For most big organizations today, that stuff is not going away. Those rules, if they exist, are not being applied to the vast majority of electronic content. Rules are way too complex. Policies are way too complex. And so to the extent that there was a huge push for records management, I mean, I have a business, Con Consulting, that does nothing but records management, day in and day out, and I can tell you, for most organizations, even big ones, it's not been particularly successful. So let me ask you, what, what qualifies you to, to talk about this, this topic, and, and what can an IT executive learn from a, a lawyer who writes books with interesting names? Yeah, so I, I spent about 20 years uh, in the information management space uh, helping uh, organizations, governmental agencies, uh, get their information management act together. Uh, this last year, I started a business called Dell. And what Dell does, it helps big organizations really operationalize that chucking daisies thing. We have hundreds of terabytes of stuff. We don't know what to do with it. It grows unfettered and it grows and it grows and it grows. And at some point, we need to get rid of that stuff. So what Dell is doing uh, as a new business, actually rather successfully, is going into big business and helping them in a legally defensible kind of way clean their storage bins of the old information that doesn't have any legal need to be around and doesn't have any business utility to be around. It's basically digital junk, right? So we're going to help them get rid of it. But beyond that, I mean, I've been thinking about this problem um, for a whole bunch of years. I started my legal career as a litigator. And if you look at most businesses today, and, and I would say the litigation response problem is a manifestation of it. Most big organizations, as I said earlier, have ubiquitously failed to manage information. Most of them are not planning retention schedules for the vast quantity of electronic stuff. And when a lawsuit happens or an investigation happens, the idea of finding everything and anything that's even potentially relevant, not only is a gargantuan burden and an expense and a gargantuan pain in the butt, but in real life, you think that they can actually grab anything and everything that's potentially relevant? I mean, you know, if you think about the land, the wind, the sand, all the places that information can be parked today, the idea of being successful in that, the idea of finding a record when you need it for business purposes and be successful with that. So, you know, to the heart of your question, I spent my life helping organizations figure this problem out, uh, and I just think about it maybe slightly more than the next guy. So in case you just joined us, we're here with Randolph Kahn, who's uh, a, an attorney. He's an expert in legal and compliant issues. He helps organizations you know, f figure out, squint through the model of the records management, records retention policy issues, and come up with ways in which they can be more effective, uh, looking at information as both an asset and a liability and trying to strike that balance. Uh, and he does this every day with his clients. Randy, tell us, talk a little bit about why it is so hard to chuck daisies. 
Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question, right? So there's a couple things that are, I think, driving organizations to the wrong place. The first thing is this erroneous or fallacious belief that storage is cheap. Oh, don't worry about it. Storage is cheap. Well, you know, and I hear this with, with, with Con Consulting and Dove clients every single day. Why are we going to take that on? Storage is cheap. We'll just keep dumping that stuff in a big parking lot and who the heck cares? Well, this is the deal. Information is growing at, for most organizations anywhere, something between 20 and 50% per year. The actual storage cost is going down slightly every year. In real dollars, what they're spending to store stuff because there's so much more you know, this year than last year. Um, fact is, storage is not cheap. Storage is a huge cost. And I'll give you an example. We're working on a project right now for a large insurance company where we're, this is a Dell project where we're helping them shuck the daisies, right? We're helping them right size their information footprint. Again, legally defensible getting rid of the information crud. To do that project, they save millions and millions of dollars per year just on the storage savings per year on a net basis. So the ROI makes sense, the TCO makes really rapid sense, right? So the first thing you have to break down is storage is not cheap. Second thing is nobody owns the information anymore. IT says, hey, it's my repository, it's my pipe, it's my box, it's not my information. I don't know what to do with the stuff inside there. The lawyers have said, well, we have lawsuits, we have investigations. You know, be very, very hesitant about what you do. And all of a sudden, between the storage is cheap and it's not my problem, I don't know what's in that system, and be you know, very hesitant, says the lawyers, people say, okay, forget about it. I'm not going to touch it. Now there's a fear. And the information grows and it grows and it grows. And again, from you know, a Dell legal defensibility perspective, the only way that you're going to clean house and not worry about being nailed for destruction of evidence or spoliation, as lawyers talk about, is having some methodology that says, I went through that stuff. I know that that stuff is not a record. I know that stuff is not otherwise needed for audit litigation investigation. It must be digital junk because we don't have any business utility with that stuff anymore. Let's get rid of it. But there's got to be some diligence around that. Otherwise, you run substantial risk in getting rid of it. You talked about uh, stor storage is not cheap, and, and lawyers aren't cheap either. Um, but And so I wanted to ask you uh, if you found with your clients that not only have you helped them save storage costs, but what about legal discovery costs? I mean, discovery is a volume-driven activity. If you've got less storage, you're, you're paying less to discover, aren't you? Yeah, so uh, uh, no question. So uh, as it relates to the way in which Dell makes the business case for our clients, we never ever go to the issue of risk mitigation or uh, litigation costs and response avoidance or being a more efficient business. Those are absolutely real, but they're soft costs. Some can be quantified and a Dell project, a you know, chucking daisies project, a defensible disposition project for a big IT department makes sense purely on storage. Now, having said that, is the cost of a lawyer uh, uh, a significant cost in terms of information review in the context of all litigation investigations for Ganshu. I mean, lawyers are incredibly expensive. And of, uh, they love the big piles of information. In fact, what I would say to you is uh, there's no question that defensively disposing of stuff makes you a more efficient business without question, right? You have much more, you talk about big data, it's big data on actually the relevant information that you need as opposed to trying to find that information nugget or that needle in that gargantuan information haystack, if you will, right? So, I mean, as it relates to the litigation response and inconvenience of costs, there's no question that that's a gargantuan cost, and it's no question that that's, uh, uh, you're going to find substantial benefit by getting rid of the crud, right? No question. So you've used this term defensible disposition a couple of times. Can you Talk a bit more about what that is and define that for our audience. Sure, sure. So, uh, you know, if you think about it this way, David, the, the, the issue is I have a shared drive, and that shared drive has uh, 
dozens or hundreds of terabytes of content in it. I don't even know what that stuff is anymore. It sits, and, and, and somebody maybe babysits the system or not, and somebody maybe access some of that stuff or not, and what you find, it just sort of sits. Well, for a, a, an organization to go in and look at hundreds of millions of files today for a big organization, we have clients that have billions of files. It's such a substantial volume. There's no way you're going to have your employees do it. First of all, they're really bad at classification. That's number one. But even if they weren't bad at it, compared to technology, it's an incredibly bad use of their time. So really, to, to, to chuck the daisies or defensively dispose, I need to have a methodology that says, I know that the stuff that I'm looking at was not a record. It's not needed any longer for business purposes. And then also, I know that it's not otherwise needed for audit litigation investigation. And I have to find a way to do that with different systems and different kinds of content and different kinds of uh, 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 business uh, arenas and environments so that I can say when we dispose of content that that stuff wasn't otherwise needed. That idea of defensibility, I disposed of it without my people looking at it. I use technology. One of the things that Dell does really efficiently is uses technology tools like the auto classification tools or the machine learning tools to do the heavy lifting, right? It's a lot more efficient, so they're a lot better than people, and it saves them a boatload of dough. But in the end, I need to do that in a kind of way that's going to make the lawyers comfortable, it's going to make their compliance people comfortable, their business people comfortable. Otherwise, at the end of that process, they're not going to want to pull the trigger to get rid of the content, right? So that defensibility or that defensible methodology allows me to evaluate content in a kind of way that at the end of that analysis, I can, in a legally defensible kind of way, throw it away in the ordinary course of business and not, not cause the lawyer some heartburn. So I want to come back to this notion of uh, uh, defensible disposal and, and uh, disposition in a second. But before I do, it sounds like a little bit like this is records management 2.0, is it? Uh, yeah, I, it's funny that you, you say that because that's exactly how I think about it. If you think, think about it this way, and I talked about this earlier, records management fails because the rules are too complex. They're too voluminous. There's nobody there to apply them. Technology can't take a thousand rules and apply it to anything. It's just, it just is a failure. Really what, what Chuck and Daisy talks about, what Dell does day in and day out, is take that old retention schedule, simplify that thing, operationalize it, and then apply it with technology because people can't. That's it in a nutshell. So uh, let me come back to defensible disposition. You talked about, I mean, essentially, <laughs> technology's gotten, in, in, gotten, gotten us into this problem. You're saying you and, and your clients work together to use technology to help us get out of this problem through classification, and it sounds like you're, you're helping them automate that classification. Talk about that a little bit more. Sure. So, so when, when Adele goes into a client, right, you, you can assume two things. They're going to have structured content, and they're going to have unstructured content. Let's deal with the structured first. The structured content, the stuff in databases, it sits there, and typically it's, it's the kind of content that doesn't uh, individual employees or businesses typically don't interact with on a regular basis. Someone needs to go in, determine what that stuff is, and determine what business rules or retention rules apply to it so that it can go away. There are clients... Uh, that Dell has, where they have huge volumes of, of structured content, where they've never applied any archiving technologies. So, you know, simple compression, simple ways to manage that content, irrespective of the end of life disposition rules. You, know, you need to come in with tools and technology and understanding of what's out there and what can be done with this, again, this gargantuan storage footprint just for the structured stuff, right? So there's tools and technology and methodology and, uh, and experts that Dell brings. On the other side of the equation, the unstructured content. Unstructured content sits in all kinds of systems. Now, there's certain kinds of uh, certain kinds of content that uh, auto classification and machine learning technologies are pretty darn good at discerning what it is. There are some file types because of the uniqueness of the technology or the file type that makes it much more challenging. You know, that said, there are technologies today that are able to 
discern what something is, able to apply a business rule to that, and uh, uh, those kinds of technologies need to uh, be harnessed more often by more companies, because as I said before, again, volumes are so great, people simply can't do it anymore. So I want to come back to this issue a little bit so and help our audience understand. So can you actually go back and, and classify, you know, with machines, ex an existing, you know, corpus of data, or are you suggesting, all right, let's, moving forward from, you know, day zero, start to auto-classify. How do you deal with that? So when Dell goes into a client, two things are happening, and I think that you, uh, the direction that, that, you, that, that you're going in is exactly correct. The first thing is I need to clean up the past. How do I clean up the past? How do I know what something is? What Dell will actually do, it'll take their retention schedule, it will simplify it, take their content, will teach their content to a computer so that when it crawls through hundreds of terabytes of stuff, it actually has learned what that content is and it can apply, and it, uh, apply the business rule, right? If, if I'm an accounting record or an HR document or a contract, whatever it is, we're able to actually go in and teach a, a incredibly robust classification engine what your records are so that instead of people doing it at night when the, when the system is not being utilized or however, the system can, can crawl through, again, terabytes or petabytes of content and make business judgments, business decisions and classification against your rules and the content that you taught it. So that's the best cleaning up the past. Dell comes in, cleans up the past. On the other side of the equation, again, auto classification, just to clean up the past, if you're a small company, you don't have a lot of data, you're not gonna wanna do it. Too complicated, too much money. And, 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 and again, to, to, to take it on, I don't want to minimize uh, the upfront exercise to actually train the software on what your content is and the rules, not, it's, not a, uh, it's not an undertaking that's without cost, without uh, inconvenience and expense. But if you have a lot of content, it makes incredible business value. The business value, again, the idea at the end of the uh, exercise is we can legally defensively get rid of huge, vast quantities of stuff it reduces that storage in a macro sense. It reduces, reduces that storage footprint, which equates to millions of dollars a year. So once those rules are built, then of course the question is, why shouldn't we use that as a new information management paradigm going forward? So what Dell is really doing is coming in and cleaning up the past, and then once you've built the rules, you might as well use them on a go-forward basis and, and be a more efficient business to actually apply retention rules in a totally different way than you have before without human intervention and doing it, I guess, real time in systems uh, seamlessly, right? And that's really what Belt is about. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the impact of, of mobile and bring your own devices. Risk is becoming increasingly decentralized by its very nature. How do you, how should IT organizations ensure that when they think something gets deleted, it actually does get deleted? So let, let me deal with both parts of your question because they're both really interesting, right? So one of the things that Chuck and Daisy does is laid out, lays out a series of rules. One of the rules is for every new technology, there's a chunk of informational output and you need to have policies up front and a way to, to manage that content before you actually implement the system, right? Well, what that tends to do is it tends to force the, the business question, do I need this content as a business record? And if I do, is there a system in which we can keep it and store it and access it? Does it make economic sense to do it this way? And if we can't actually readily retain this stuff and store this stuff, how are we going to actually satisfy our legal requirements or how are we going to take care of our business needs? Forcing that policy conversation up front forces you to deal with those issues. At the end of the, at the, end of the life cycle, the issue is, what am I going to do about all this content that exists that I otherwise need to get rid of. And this is, again, from my perspective, most organizations have to build into the process when they develop policy and that, uh, that new technology implementation up front to say, at the end of its useful life, who is going to own disposition? Who is going to actually effectuate the, the disposal of this content? How are we going to do that in a legally defensible kind of way? And if organizations, in particular, or IT executives, 
build that into the process up front, you'd find a great deal less inconvenience, expense, business inefficiency, uh, litigation uh, response bloodshed happening. And, and that's where IT organizations, and in particular, IT executives, need to start wrapping their head around. So talk about who in the organization cares or should care of, about defensible disposition. So in our Delve experience, the people that really care are IT executives. So the mid-level storage guy says, yeah, this seems to make sense. When you take it all the way up to the food chain and say, we can save you 20 or 30 or $40 million per year. Are you interested? It's a really easy sale. Oh, and by the way, your lawyers are going to like it because litigation response is going to be a heck of a lot easier and it's going to be a heck of a lot cheaper and your privacy guy is going to like it because we're going to reduce your privacy uh, uh, in your PHI and P uh, PII uh, information risk footprint and, and, and that's a good thing and your business executives like it because my employees that now spend 10% up to 25% of my time looking for stuff that will be reduced so I'll make my employees more efficient and, and my customers who can actually get answers from me much more readily. You'll find that business will be augmented. The selling defensible disposition is incredibly, incredibly easy on storage alone. There are so many other really significant benefits, but the people that find the greatest value and understand it immediately is the CIO, right? Immediately. Why? Because I can hand them a whole chunk of money for them to utilize especially in a party economy, utilized for buying new technology, hiring new people, building other efficiencies, it's just, just dead money. Why not chuck the daisies and do something with that dough? So the book is Chuck Chucking Daisies by Randolph Kahn, How Companies Deal with Big Data. So tell, tell us a little bit more about the book. How did you organize it? What can people expect to see when it hits the stands? Sure. So um, the book is structured as simple rules, right? There's 18, 19 simple rules that help organizations, and again, primarily IT uh, professionals really understand, right? So a, 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 a rule might be, for example, never implement technology unless you have policy first, and we talked about that. Now that may seem like no-brainer, but the number of organizations that, that, that technology sneaks into and all of a sudden they uh, social networking is a perfect example, right? When you wake up one day and you have a big insurance company and you realize that all your sales agents are using Facebook to sell policies. Wonderful for business. But wait, you know, we have compliance requirements. We have record retention requirements. What if we have to spot respond to litigation? We have some privacy concerns because it was their, their, their Facebook account. Every single organization that looks at social networking that says, hey, there's some value here, needs to stop first and build that policy construct, right, as we talked about. So the rules are really very straightforward, very pragmatic, very easy to understand, and we use real life to actually make it uh, come alive. And I probably should uh, uh, point out to you that I have a co-author, uh, Galina Gatsatsky uh, is my co-author, so I'm not doing it by myself. <laughs> and the book uh, is, will be out roughly when? In the next couple months. Excellent. All right, Randy, really appreciate you coming on theCUBE, spending some time with us, sharing uh, your best practices and your knowledge with our community. We'd love to have you back, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at IOD. We're, the Cube will be at IOD uh, next week. We'll be there Monday and Tuesday in Las Vegas, and I uh, hope to have Randy on again, uh, talking about these and other issues. So again, Randy, thanks very much for, for coming on theCUBE. Hey, love, love to join you, thank you so much. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time. This is Dave Vellante at Wikibon Headquarters, and this is The Cube.